Welcome, Dr. Greer. Thank good you. Again. Great seeing you again, Pat. Yeah, good seeing you. Um, Dr. Greer, this has been a very difficult few weeks for the world. Uh, we have all watched the conflict unfolding in the Ukraine and with heavy hearts for all. Uh, and I know that many, many people have reached out with questions as one can imagine. Can you share with us some of your thoughts on this conflict and, and maybe as it relates to the most questions begin with, why will the ETs not step in and help with this? Yeah, well, first I want to say that this is, you know, of course, the, the worst conflict, the most dangerous one uh, since World War II in Europe. Um, although it's certainly not the, the only conflict that you know, we've witnessed in, in recent years. Uh, I think that it's monstrous when any country is invaded by another country. Uh, it was monstrous, frankly, when the United States invaded Iraq uh, under false pretenses, and I said so then. And it's now been proven that uh, Dick Cheney and his henchmen uh, falsely created uh, weapons of mass destruction evidence that Saddam Hussein did not have to justify going into there for reasons I'll get to in a moment. Uh, now we have a monstrous situation, horrible, where we have innocent uh, children, women, civilians uh, being targeted, uh, who are mostly defenseless in terms of their own ability to stop things raining from the sky. Uh, but it's much more dangerous. And the reason it's much more dangerous is that uh, Ukraine is surrounded by or adjacent to uh, several NATO countries, which, of course, are part of uh, the United States, Great Britain and France and other uh, you know, nuclear powers. Russia has one of the biggest, if not largest, nuclear arsenals in the world. And so it's very different than a situation where uh, horrific things ha have happened in other regions of the world. Um, the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, back some decades ago, a million innocent civilians were killed during that conflict. Uh, and uh, we, we've had seen this throughout human history. But now we're, we could, this disaster, if it's not handled properly, could put us on the brink of World War III, a truly uh, catastrophic situation. And in the meanwhile, what isn't being discussed is context and history of this. And I think that one of the big problems is that there is not global initiatives to enforce peace. And that sounds crazy, but you have to enforce a peace. And humans have to have peace on earth and peace in space. And we've been going in the wrong direction uh, ever since World War II. Uh, of course, the United Nations was formed after World War II, but it's a toothless paper tiger, frankly. Uh, and so you still are left with uh, warmongers and superpower conflicts and uh, their aspirations. And there are grievances on all sides, for example. And by, what, what I'm about to say, no way, in no way, justifies the monstrous destruction and invasion of Ukraine going on by Russia right now. However, those of you need a history lesson refresher, perhaps. When the Soviet Union fell apart 30 some years ago, NATO and the United States agreed not to expand NATO eastward. However, seven of the eight Warsaw Pact countries, which were Soviet satellite countries and Soviet territories, are now part of NATO. And this has upset Russia for 30 years. So there's a history of people on all sides reneging on their agreements in this push to full continuously militarize the world. And, and this is, you know, it's, you know, it's funny, back in the 90s when I was meeting with uh, Boutrous Boutrous Ghali, the UN Secretary General and his wife, and Leah Ghali turned in and leaned into me talking about all these conflicts with all these people manipulating geopolitical situations, saying a pox on all their houses because she was so disgusted by it. And I said, yes, but, you know, there's some root problems to this that we, we need to start talking about. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. And it squarely has to do with the UFO issue in a way that may shock people, shocking. And when I first started this process, when I was a very young doctor briefing people like the director of the CIA for Bill Clinton and others, I brought up the fact that the geopolitical situation that is central to uh, the projection of military power 
is rooted in the energy system we use, oil. So let me translate for you. When people say our vital national security interests in the Middle East, what are they talking about? They're not talking about the sand, the camels, or the culture, or the religion. They're talking about oil and gas. Now we have a situation where Western Europe is completely uh, hostage and dependent on Russian oil and gas. Uh, we have a situation where the catastrophe in Venezuela has been empowered by that oil wealth, Nigeria. Greg Easterbrook, years ago in the New Republic, wrote an article about oil being the black curse, referring to the fact that these petrostates, where there's a great deal of oil wealth, end up being corrupt kleptocracies, where oligarchs and leaders take the wealth of the nation. It doesn't really benefit the man on the street, but it empowers military hunters, militarism, et cetera, and so on. Uh, similarly, the countries that don't have enough oil then become very dependent and will have to capitulate to uh, tyranny or to the reality of the fact that they have to keep the lights on and their houses heated and their factories running. And unfortunately, this is not possible unless we bring out the underlying covert viciously sequestered secret UFO technologies. We're gonna talk about this for the next hour. Now, the, what's happening right now was predictable, avoidable. And my frustration, you're hearing it in my voice, is that in, in the briefings I, I did all the way back when I met with the science advisors to the presidents, including uh, Vice President Al Gore's science advisor, Dr. Kohlenberg, and begged them, begged them to declassify and get to the bottom of these technologies, even if it was dangerous to do so, even if they were threatened, and they were. Because if we do not get off these uh, oil, gas, coal, and public utility systems, that, le that not only is damaging the environment, and 5 million people a, a year die just from the particulate matter from lung disease and heart disease. People don't know this. Forget about global warming. People are dying by the millions just from the junk in the air. This is a, go look this statistic up. And so we have a situation in the Ukraine and with Russia that has been a, a allowed to happen over a number of issues, not just the oil issue. That's one of them. But the underlying world order that's so dysfunctional in large part where there's been conflict all over the world has to do with superpower and other states jockeying for commodity and resource control that translates to energy and oil and coal and uranium and so forth. So now that's a very dangerous situation. It's one thing when it happens during World War I and World War II and people are hurling, you know, uh, artillery and things of this sort, or dropping conventional bombs. But when you have thousands of thermonuclear weapons, uh, each of which are multiple times more destructive than the ones dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this is a game of chicken that's been going on for decades that's been avoidable. Uh, and so I think that people have to understand that the geopolitical reality of the world, the militarism in the world, the centralized power of a, a number of states has to do with the energy and the commodities and the petrodollar system, et cetera, and so forth. So these great power conflicts, are, which all nations have engaged in through human history, are greatly exacerbated by what Mr. Easterbrook called the black curse, oil and gas and with it coal and all, you know, all, the, all the conventional energy systems, which for 100 years, since the time of Nikola Tesla, we have not needed. Um, now, as far as the extraterrestrial question, you know, we've talked about this a lot, Pat. I remember back in the 1990s being asked by uh, a, a woman who was from Japan, when I was given a presentation, I said, why didn't the ETs stop? 
those two bombs from incinerating hundreds of thousands of people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I said, well, they were certainly aware we were doing this. But if they were to intervene, A, humanity would learn no lessons. B, we would be portraying them as invaders. This is a huge problem. If you look at the cosmic hoax, which we re released about eight months ago, nine months ago, you know, we articulate the reason why there's been a 70-year strategic defense plan to demonize the ET and UFO presence, because that's ultimately the last card, quote unquote, that Werner von Braun, who invented the rocket trade off Hitler in World War II, warned us about, that they would try to concoct an alien threat. Now imagine if there was a force from another star system that came in and intervened on one side or another in this kind of squabble. They're, 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 it's a lose-lose situation, unfortunately. And the worst would be the future of humans and extraterrestrials being together peacefully because it would immediately be taken by these spin artists, like we've seen in the last three or four years since Unacknowledged came out, there's been one lackey working on behalf of the intelligence community after another on 60 Minutes, CNN, all over the world, talking about the threat to the national security by UFOs. It's been a constant drumbeat. Now, imagine in this milieu, in this environment, there's an ET overt intervention or even covert, and suddenly you have a situation where people will then be through the mass media that's controlled by the intelligence community, would pivot to, oh my God, not only do we have this conflict going on in an area the size of Texas, Ukraine, now we're being invaded by aliens, and it would be taken and spun in that direction faster than the speed of light. I know it. Everyone in the intelligence community I've met with knows it. So if, look, if we have figured this out and, and people I've dealt with on the Senate Intelligence Committee that, that we've had conversations, if, if we have figured this out, you know they have, these interstellar civilizations have. And so they're waiting for humans to become civilized. And civilized means we don't address our grievances by bombing the hell out of each other or killing each other. We can discuss it, we can do whatever. Uh, now, once you get to a situation like this, where you have a relatively poorly armed uh, country like Ukraine being in, invaded by a superpower, then you're on the, the horns of a dilemma. If there's enough, if there's a, a significant intervention from NATO or the United States, Russia, and the, the, the Putin and, and his foreign minister have said, that's World War III. So if, if you're at the Pentagon, and I'm dealing with this as we speak tonight, talking to people, then you run the risk of being in World War III. But the worst version of World War III would be an interplanetary conflict, which would mean if the ETs were to intervene. Now, this is a sad situation, but there's another part of this, and that is, let's take some recent history. United States, after 9-11, invaded not only Iraq, but before that, Afghanistan. We just catastrophically extricated ourselves from there in the most bungled, clumsy mess I've ever seen. But the idea was that we were going to go in there and do nation building. That's the euphemism. We're going to go in there, and the warlords and everyone else will be converted somehow to Western Jeffersonian democracies. Well, how well did that work out? It didn't. It's a disaster. It's probably as bad or worse now than it was when we went in 20 years ago, even though we've spent $2 trillion and endless hundreds of thousands of, of innocent civilians in Afghanistan have died. Now, the, the ETs know this. Every world that has a proclivity towards conflict has to reach a point where they're going to decide, are we going to live together in peace on Earth and peace in space or face annihilation? That's 
the question that we have been facing for 70 years, but it has not been framed properly. Because the only way we're gonna to get to a peaceful and enlightened civilization is collective security where we all agree that whatever geopolitical boundaries exist are inviolate. One country does not invade another or attack another. And if it does, every nation on earth would, do, would stop it. But the world is not in that state now. There is no consensus uh, from every nation on earth to stop anyone from doing anything, which is why these problems keep continuing. Uh, now, there is, I'm just gonna call this, and I, I've never really talked about this explicitly, something that I call the cosmic organization. There's an interstellar, interplanetary organization, it's cosmic, that have certain principles. And one of them is that they do not invade and enforce their level of civilization on a less developed civilization. They watch, they may do things behind the scenes and they have. For example, 20th anniversary of the Disclosure Project, everyone saw this, it's up on our YouTube channel now. We had a Russian general talking about how they had a nuclear weapon overheating. And ETs went in and sort of put everyone in sort of a suspended animation while they went in and fixed this so it didn't blow up. Why? Because if that missile had exploded, the U.S. might have thought that they were doing a launch or we were entering into DEFCON 1, Defense Condition 1, where all nuclear missiles would be launched. So the ETs absolutely have done a few things like that to keep us from the worst case scenarios happening, very behind the scenes. And that's not the only one. Similar events have happened in the United States that I know, have personal knowledge of from Disclosure Project witnesses. But in terms of an overt intervention, as opposed to doing something just to buy us time until we grow up, uh, no, that is not going to happen. Now, what are the conditions in which there would be a massive intervention? Let's talk about that. I wrote about this in my 1999 book, Extraterrestrial Contact the evidence and implications in my first book out of five. Now I understand it's not in fashion to read, but if people would please read this, there, it, it has a very explicit chapter on uh, the UFO extraterrestrial subject uh, and a comprehensive assessment. Now that comprehensive assessment that's in that book was done at the request of a certain three letter agency. And it, it made its way through the aerospace industry. And I'll never forget when Dr. Robert Woods, who is a uh, aerospace engineer and subsequent disclosure project witness who worked for McDonnell Douglas, of course merged later with Boeing. Uh, he, he called me up. This is how I met him. He says, and he was calling from McDonnell Douglas, and this is in the 90s, he said, this is the most accurate assessment of this subject we have ever read. And it had gone through the intelligence community and the aerospace industry. And this was before I was too much in the public eye, frankly. And I was doing this as a, an, an emergency doctor shuttling between North Carolina and DC and doing this stuff. You know, it's a crazy life I've had. Um, but I said, well, thank you. And he says, but how do you know this? I said, well, I've had contact with the ETs and I understand what the cosmic organization's policies are. And a key policy is that they do not intervene unless it gets to something where it would be an ELE, an extinction level event. Now, what are those? Okay, one would be a massive thermonuclear exchange, not one or two, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but something that could literally damage the entire earth as being a place where suitable for the evolution of intelligent life, which is a long-term objective of these civilizations. It goes back millions of years, frankly, on earth. The second would be a geophysical cat catastrophe. For example, if we continue to degrade the biosphere at the rate we're degrading it, and I'll remind people that in 1997, 25 years ago, I had a, uh, about a 10 or 11 hour meeting with the deputy director of the National Science Foundation in charge of studying climate change, uh, Dr. Uh, 
Bob Carell, and Dr. Nancy Maynard, who was one of the five directors of NASA. And she was in charge of what was called the mission to planet Earth. I thought it was funny because I had called the ET mission to Earth, the mission to planet Earth. But they had their own mission to planet Earth, and she was a PhD satellite imaging specialist for NASA that imaged the biosphere from space. Now, this is 97, a quarter of a century ago. And she turned to me and she said, Dr. Greer, if the public knew the rate of decay of the biosphere that is happening, there would be, and I'm quoting, widespread panic in the streets. Now, if that continues, and we do have situations happen, you could you know, lose, lose both polar ice caps, that could destabilize the rotational stability of the earth and its wobble goes back and forth. It's called the seasons, right? It tilts, tilts, tilts. You could have a catastrophic situation. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just telling you, you know, as the Chinese proverb goes, unless we change directions, we are likely to end up where we are going. Now, the ETs have been warning about this since the 50s. We've been warning about it. It's fallen on deaf ears from Moscow to Washington to Beijing to wherever. Um, now, so here we are in 2022 facing this situation. But people need to understand that the ETs have assets deployed around the Earth, under the Earth, under the oceans, out in our solar system, et cetera. And those are for these worst case scenarios that I mentioned in this comprehensive assessment paper that's in our first book. Now, I know what I'm talking about tonight's a bit heavy and it's kind of intellectual and I apologize for it. But, you know, but it's time that we all begin to speak as adults here. Um, it, we're getting very long in the game that Werner von Braun warned about uh, of this last card being played. And there's all kinds of chicanery going on uh, where various powers behind the scenes want to see this spiral further and further out of control. Um, I know from people I deal with in Washington that certain people have go bags ready to go who are dealing with Homeland Security and, and other um, departments. And it's, it's a situation that isn't being honestly addressed to the American people or to the world public. But the ETs know exactly what, what's going on. And this is what they were concerned about. When they met with uh, President Eisenhower in 1956 in Muroc, which did happen, when I was doing the briefings and putting things together for President Sarkozy, the president of France, and doing the CE5 contact demonstration for their uh, Ministry of Defense back uh, about 10 years, 12 years ago, I got this document that was an account of someone who was at that meeting that the French intelligence had about the meeting with Eisenhower and these ETs out in the desert, near where Edwards Air Force Base is now, but this is 1956, where they were asking us to put down arms, to become peaceful, to do things to, for the Earth and its environment, and to be in space peacefully. Eisenhower was inclined to do so. The warmongers, the war profiteers, the industrial fascists said no. And then they further later cut him, the president, Eisenhower, out of the loop. That's why he gave his famous speech, Beware the Military Industrial Complex, in 1961 as he was leaving office, the day he left office as president, after being a president for eight years. So I think that, and he was a Republican. I mean, this was not an anti-military hippie, Abby Hoffman or something in the 60s. Uh, this is, you know, a, a five-star you know, five general and uh, moderately conservative Republican saying this. Of course, and everybody was sort of like, what's this all about? Well, we know what it was about. It was this issue. So now here we are from 1961 to now. How many years is that, right? <laughs> We're talking, you know, 61 years. Um, and almost two-thirds of a century, and we're still doing the same behavior. And of course, you know, the very definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. 
and, and, and so that's, you know, the context. I think people need to have a big picture of, 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 of viewing this. Now, it doesn't solve that problem. I mean, my view, I'm not, you know, a State Department official, is that there needs to be an immediate ceasefire. Uh, Ukraine, if I think the wise choice at this point would to say we're going to be neutral the way Sweden and Finland and Switzerland are. And we're not going to be a militarized NATO country. And uh, Russia has said that that would satisfy them. Well, if Sweden and Finland and, and, and uh, Switzerland, who are in the heart of Europe and advanced Western democracies, have agreed not to be part of NATO, so can the Ukraine. But that's, that's a, an immediate sort of tactical political issue. I want to get to the bigger root problems that we've been talking about here. And, and, and the next thing I want to go into is the technologies. When you have a civilization that goes 100 years longer using a destructive form of energy that is scarce and relatively expensive, such as oil, gas, coal, public utilities, and also solar and wind, very expensive, and very low density of energy, you have a situation where the world geopolitically is vulnerable to uh, the machinations of people who are controlling those assets. Now, to give you an idea of the kind of wealth we're talking about, just on the Chicago Board of Trade, some years ago, I read a, an Economist article that was talking about derivatives and instruments for trading commodities, $700 trillion worth a year. Now, just the churning of those instruments, you know, futures, contracts, and all this, imagine what that generates. Now, if you come out with zero-point energy, energy that you pull from the quantum vacuum of space around us, you have zero cost for the energy. <laughs> it's completely decentralized. Every home business, et cetera, has quote unquote free energy, what Tesla called the infinite energy field. Um, there's no pollution, there's no radiation, and there's no cost. But there's also no centralized power. So let me cut to the chase. This is the, the world order as it exists is about massive. And we're not talking about the budget of the United States, you know, a few trillion dollars, hundreds, if not thousands of trillions of dollars in assets, commodities, corporations that are linked directly into the type of energy that runs the planet for 8 billion people. The other problem with it is that it's intrinsically destabilizing geopolitically, as we were talking about a moment ago with the situation where Western Europe is very dependent on Russian gas and oil. And you know, how do you bite the hand that's feeding you, right? Like the Nine Inch Nails song, you know, how you bite the hand that feeds you. Um, but it's something broader than that. You have a, a situation with those energy systems that require a priori that about half the world's population live in terrible poverty and injustice. I was just reading an article that 3 billion, with a B, billion people have no gas and no electricity. And that's why they're chopping down woods and brush and old growth forests and rainforests to make charcoal and get wood to cook their food. 3 billion, with a B. Now that's almost a billion people more than lived on earth in the 20s when Nikola Tesla had free energy. So this is a massive problem that we have been discussing and trying to get people in power to do something about. Uh, there's only so much one can do through that, the establishment though, because virtually everyone in power, whether it's in the United States or Moscow or elsewhere, uh, do not want to take on interests that have a thousand times more power, let's say, and, and money than the White House can deploy or 10 Downing Street can or whatever in France, anywhere, you know. So I think that this is a, a situation where the uh, industrial fascism that started in the 1800s and early 1900s that Mussolini adopted and then Hitler adopted, 
it never went away. It just became more nuanced. But the world situation we have, the, the real power is rooted in industrial fascism of various sorts. Um, and that's true of whether it's a, you know, a centralized uh, sort of totalitarian system like China or Russia and Venezuela or an alleged democracy like the United States, United Kingdom, uh, et cetera. And that's just the reality of the power that is a derivative directly of the type of energy we use. <laughs> so I always tell people bringing out these new technologies is about truly power to the people, literally in terms of energy power, but figuratively. But right now, everyone is basically a sitting duck dependent on this stuff. Your house, my house. I don't know. I have the largest, listen to this. I have the largest legally allowable solar farm in the state of Virginia, right here. I'm pointing at it in my meadow. It will not heat or cool this house at all. The lights, yeah, may be the water for the pump. But when we had a foot of wet snow in January, all power went out in this region for a week. We were in this house with 38 degree temperatures. No heat. In the summer, we had a derecho come through. We had neighbors with no electricity for three weeks in a 106 degree heat index. And this is in the United States of America in, in, in the 21st century. Now, imagine the desperation of the people in Ukraine. These cities are being bombed. They have no water. Yesterday, a six-year-old child died in one of those cities because there was no water. He, in, in the 21st century, in the central part of Europe, a child dies because there's no water to drink. A hundred years after we had the solution to the environmental energy and prosperity and justice, social justice issue. So I'm telling people, the governments are not going to fix this problem. Had I thought Washington or other people around the world and, and capitals would have done anything about it. I would have never come public with the disclosure project ever. I did it 20 years, 21 years ago, because we had concluded by 1997, 98, that the people of the world are going to have to unite. They're going to have to fund and support these technologies. They're going to have to bring them out open source. And that's why that's been one of the three pillars that we, our project is resting on. One is peaceful contact and enlightenment with ETs and humans, the CE5 contact initiative. And be, anyone in the world can get the CE5 contact app and do this. And people are. The other is the disclosure project because people have to be educated about it. And the third is trying to bring the technologies, the physical technologies out that we have not succeeded at, obviously. Um, now we have a situation, 50, 60% of the population believe we're not alone in the universe. That we have done. There are millions of people doing CE5 contact, having peaceful contact, but the world is still a basket case because it's still dependent on the black curse of, of the old energy system from the 1800s. Now, I think the solution is, is sitting there for us, but it's costly. You know, we crowdfunded our documentaries, we crowdfunded the app, we crowdfunded the disclosure project. Uh, we have no office or staff, as you know. 100% um, of these proceeds go in to further the work and, uh, and we would like to see it further reach the point where we could actually develop these technologies. But that we're talking about is tens of millions of dollars. You're not going to develop a high energy physics lab for a few hundred thousand dollars. One workstation is 500,000 to a million dollars using the kind of equipment you need. So now you would think in an age of high tech Silicon Valley unicorns, billion dollar startups doing frivolity <laughs> and IPOs behind you know, things like TikTok or whatever, bringing in, you know, untold billions. That wouldn't be so hard, but nobody has wanted to do it yet. Now I'm making an appeal tonight. People need to do it. 
and we can prove that these technologies exist. Who wants to fund them? That is an act of courage because it's an act of defiance. I mean, just like the Ukrainian people are trying to defy this, you know, brutal invasion. The people of the world need to unite in an act of peaceful defiance of the, the current world order of petro-Nazis, fascism based on the current energy system. And I think that you, when you think about this, I mean, people new to this who may be just now watching this YouTube channel, you know, look at this thing they call the Tic Tac that our Navy jets, I just had a long conversation with the pilot of that jet fighter that chased uh, you know, that uh, Tic Tac off the coast of California some years ago in the early 2000s. Um, and that thing was moving up, down, vertical, <laughs> no means of propulsion, no jets, no rockets. And they had infrared on it, no heat source like you get from something being burned. It's electromagnetic field propulsion. And guess what? Those have been developed since before I was born. That thing flying around, when we mastered gravity control, the top scientist at the Naval Research Lab was in the, quote, vault and saw the unredacted document that stated that that was mastered in October of 1954. So now we're talking, you know, 68 years ago. And so you think, okay, two thirds of a century later, we still are using rockets, jets, cars, coal, gas, and oil burning power plants, nuclear power, which is very dangerous. And yes, we have 20% of our electricity in the United States from hydroelectric, that's 7.5%, and, and wind and, and solar. The problem is, the, uh, you know, if you have, a, say, a Tesla car or an electric car, and, you know, we have two. We have two that are plug-in electric hybrid. That energy is coming out of a coal-fired and gas-fired power grid, except for maybe 19, 20% of that energy. So people think that when you plug in your electric car, it's magically getting charged from the ether. No, it's from a very polluting source. Um, and the, the lithium-ion batteries, the hundreds of pounds of lithium-ion batteries, the pollution that's created by manufacturing those is enormous toxic waste. So that, you know, it, it, it makes people feel good, Pat, but it's not the solution. My solar farm is great. I'm trying to help. It's not the ultimate solution. Um, we know what the solution is, but when the vice president, Al Gore, and Al Gore did an inconvenient truth, and is this great champion of the environment, but guess what? Think about the enormous hypocrisy of being the vice president of the United States, receiving this information, this positive proof of these technologies existing. But because it's too dangerous to stick your neck out, you turn your back on it, and then you just bloviate for decades about the problem, but refuse to endorse the solutions. And that's true of people on the left, the right, the middle, the whole thing. So, this is something that I speak of with authority because I've had taken the meetings with people like this around the world. And I understand the fear. I do. I mean, I understand the lethal threats that are made. I under, I've had them. I understand the people who've been killed. I have people on my team that have been assassinated. I've almost been assassinated. But, you know, you have now, you know, a situation where 8 billion people's lives hang in the balance, not only from the risk of thermonuclear war, but of environmental collapse. And so I think we have to grow up and we have to decide that as a people, we're gonna to come together and manifest the courage that obviously our, unfortunately, our leaders lack. So this is where I am 100% nonpartisan and apolitical because I have dealt with people on all sides of the aisle in multiple countries and none of them wanna do the right thing because it's dangerous and it is dangerous. And I had a person with an MBA say to me once, you know, your problem is you're not willing to, to, to you, you tell the truth about the risks and the benefits. I said, well, I'm a doctor. You, you always disclose what the benefits and the risks are or you're unethical.
if not assaulting a patient. And I said, he says, yes, but that's not how business works. <laughs> you just sort of like brush over the risk and, and, and blow up the benefits. No, I mean, it's clearly you have to be honest about this because these the, people's lives are in the balance here. Um, and I understand that, you know, all the hundreds of people who come to me with top secret documents and information, they are in mortal danger and they are heroes. But we're not going to find that kind of, of uncommon courage, as it's called, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue under any president I've dealt with since Clinton. You're, I, if, if there's a member of Congress that has that kind of courage, please introduce them to us. I'm in Washington every week. Uh, or someone in a, some other uh, government. In the meanwhile, I wouldn't bet the farm on it. I think we, the people, have got to unite, bring up the definitive solutions, which we have been extant in existence since before you and I were born, and we're not spring chickens, honey. So I think that's what we have to do. And I think that when you look at how these UFOs move, the man-made ones and the ET ones, those technologies are very elegant because they're electromagnetic field propulsion. And they're pulling energy from so-called zero point, but through the, what's called the quantum vacuum. I'm not going to get into the physics of this too far. And then you take it to another level and you can go from point A to B in space, you know, like that, you know, almost like a teleportation, what well, it is. But just the, 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 what I call level one advanced technology would be something that sits in your house like your heat pump. It runs your house at, with no energy costs and no pollution. That is what can be created now and distributed. And I had a conversation with the head of the Air Force, in char a colonel in charge of future technologies, which is a euphemism for this kind of thing. They call it future when they already have it, by the way. Remember the double speak military and intelligence people. Um, I should do a whole workshop on counterintelligence and double speak in, in these communities. But, um, and you know, they, they go to a place called the farm out here in Virginia to learn how to professionally lie about all this. I know where I know people have been there. Um, I go by it every time I go into DC from my house here. And what's interesting is that he said to me, he says, don't the it's too early to bring out the things that fly because that can be turned into a missile delivery system i.e a man-made ufo but yeah the ones that are this the ones that would run your car or house those you know we think would be fine if you brought those out but he didn't speak for this group of psychopaths and sociopaths that run that are the uber oligarchs of the planet running the whole petrodollar and oil and and, and macroeconomic system they do not want that out because they know they're going to go the way of all flesh because the power they have literally the physical power but then the figurative power they have would slip through their fingers like grains of sand and they know it because then every village in africa has free energy and electrification refrigeration even the deserts will bloom as it says in this in scriptures because you can then have water delivered now, one of the things that's coming out, um, some of you have seen this, and people think it's a film that I did. It's not. It's called Above Top Secret. Um, and it's a nod also to the great book that uh, Timothy Good wrote back in the 80s. I believe it was called Above Top Secret. But it's about these technologies, and it's coming out April 5th. It's exciting because it's coming out three days before the April conference we're doing in Scottsdale, which is going to be about all our, our community coming together and meditation and enlightenment and praying for peace, but also acting and creating peace with humans and ETs, but also on earth. And we're gonna do a big meditation and go around the world with thousands of people online. I hope millions of people online and everyone there creating and seeing through higher consciousness, the world transitioning very quickly off the path it's on now onto this path of enlightenment and peace on earth and in space and peaceful energy. Uh, and I think that's where, how we get to a level one civilization. Level one civilization is one that's living in peace and that is uh, not damaging its environment anymore because it's adapted, uh, adopted, I should say, since they exist already, these wonderful, wondrous sciences and technologies 
that have been coming through the minds of humans for over 100 years. In fact, I have documents and information that even in the mid to late 1800s, these electromagnetic effects were seen and documented, uh, but they weren't understood. They were really well understood by the 1920s to 1950s, actually, including so-called anti-gravity. T. Townsend Brown, 19, late 1920s, had elect high voltage systems with crystalline materials where they would levitate. That was then reproduced in Germany, the Kolosky Frost experiment. We have the cover of a physics journal that shows this. So that's 100 years ago now, my friend. So what are, what are we doing? I mean, we have to have a global awakening. And this is, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, you know, people like Demi Lovato. I said, this is one of the reasons why we need Demi and other people who have been helping us get the word out, get the word out, because we need to get the word out way past the, you know, few thousand people who are interested in, in, in the UFO subculture, let's say. It's got to go mainstream. And now that, you know, a billion people have heard and seen the fact that there's, there are UFOs and we have footage and the Pentagon has acknowledged they're real, although they pretend they don't know what they are and they're a threat to the national security. That part of it's false, but at least it's, it's, it's a dialogue now. And this is why we can engage in a dialogue as we are doing in Washington with, with senior members of the Congress and, and, and government. But that's a very slow process. And usually it gets thwarted. And this is why the default, it's really resting on your shoulders and my show, everyone who is, is a civilian who understands this. Um, because the people in the system, this is an interesting thing. I, I've only told this story a couple of times, but back in the early 90s, it was 1992. And the head of army intelligence had intercepted me. And after we had the uh, four ET craft appear in the sky in Florida near Gulf Breeze in Pensacola. And General Stubblebine was there with uh, some of his associates with, from the CIA and NSA um, about a month later in Atlanta. And they pulled me aside and threatened me, frankly. And a month later offered me $2 billion if I would shut up and join their committee. And I said, no, thank you. Um, they, they went to my wife, tried to convince her to convince me. But during the course of the, that event, which was shocking to me, frankly, there was a woman who I don't want to name, who's a good friend with Prince Charles and the, the royal family in, in the United Kingdom who was there. And I was sort of very young to this. I was, it was 92. <laughs> I'd only been on the scene doing this for a year and a half or something. And she says, you know, the, the reason they're so angry with you is that they can't do what you're doing. I said, oh, I'm sure they could. I could teach them to meditate and do, no, no, she's not that. They're lifers. They're owned by this system. They're in that system and they'll never be able to get out and you're free. She says, you don't know where you're lucky. You're lucky because you're a nobody. You're lucky because you're not in that system. You're lucky because you're a country doctor rattling around in an emergency department in North Carolina. And I, I looked at her and I said, well, I've never thought of it that way. He, she says, well, you should think of it that way. So that's what I'm saying to everyone tonight. View yourselves as being lucky that you are empowered to be free and to do what is right and follow your conscience. But also you've got to put one foot in front of the other and make a difference because we are entering into a very writ large, dangerous phase of human civilization. And we are going to be faced with these existential life and death, extinction, or going forward choices. They've been coming at us for 50, 60, 70 years. They're going to come at us much more quickly now. And I think this is a call to action right. for people to come together. And, you know, um, whenever we talk about this in groups, the first thing that people say is, what can I do? I mean, they all feel mm -hmm. like they're just one person. Mm -hmm. They're one person in, in this sea of, of whatever, and they think that they're completely mm -hmm. irrelevant, right? And they, yeah. they, they, yeah. 
they have no power. And, yeah. and it's amazing for me to see this in people. They have no idea the power that they have. Oh, every human being has infinite power. Yes. And so I mean, literally, literally, this is what they will ask. What can I do? What is step number one for me? What would you say to them? Number one, connect to the aspect of yourself that is the infinite self that I mean, my, my lucky situation was that I grew up very poor and, and very in a difficult situation. But then I was lucky enough to die when I was 17 and had this beautiful experience, you know, um, and of, of the aspect of ourselves, of all of us, that's the singularity of oneness, the oneness of pure consciousness. That's at the root of our being awake. You're awake now, I'm awake. Anyone listening to this is conscious. If you're a sentient awake being, you have the totality of that infinite field of consciousness and energy and power within you. Now, it, thinking intellectually about it, don't make it so. You've got to practice meditation. You need to introspection. Then you have to act. And the action is where everyone drops the ball because you will be guided and get intuitions. And then you'll go, ah, I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. Now, everything I've done in my life that's been meaningful has been against the conventional wisdom. You know, and it's, it's very personal. I mean, I literally have had to do the opposite of what everyone told me I could do and should do. So I think that now I'm a bit of a cantankerous son of a bitch. People who know me well, I mean, I take no prisoners and, you know, I'm a nice guy until I'm not nice. And then it's the, uh, I'm a bit of a bull. But, you know, but the, the truth is everyone has their God-given temperament and gifts. And everyone has to ask themselves, not me or you, what can I do? What can I contribute at a time like this? And everyone has enough. It, if everyone contributed what they could and came together, the world would be changed in a fortnight. Yeah, Two people weeks. have a lot of doubt. Um, they'll get to that that's point. The, that, yeah. Yes, that's the first thing you have to overcome. You have to, you yeah. know, because I, I had that too. Look, I was raised in a family where we were told we were worthless. You know, I, I went home every day. We didn't go to kindergarten. Only rich people could afford kindergarten back at then. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went home every day of first grade, uh, sent home crying. because I was told I could never read. I could never do anything, that, that I was worthless. So I started so low. And had to kind of overcome that, which I think was, in the long run, probably good for me. It was not easy. But I think that that's why people have to look at themselves and go, you know, if, if a guy who came out of the background I came out of can do what, you know, I became a doctor, da-da-da, who cares? You can do anything, but you have to see you can do it. You have to believe in yourself. And you have to not listen to the naysayers, either you're own inner voice that's saying no or the external ones that's saying this isn't possible right luckily by about fourth or fifth grade i realized that i would have to just you know take my own path and march to my own drummer and i did um for better or for worse not always for better you know sometimes for worse because i'm a willful person and you know you you know you can make mistakes but i think that ultimately you you have to actualize and realize yourself and i think the thing that gave me the best grounding for that first was my spirituality i think from my native i'm 5 16th cherokee native american connection to earth and my first great love spiritually was earth the gaia and then when i had the near-death experience i realized this cosmic consciousness and experience and realized well, that's what we and who we really are we have this infinite aspect of ourself as well as our individual self, and it's all woven together. So when that happened, I was 17, but I think that everyone through meditation can realize this aspect of themselves because that's also how you have uncommon courage. Because if you realize that your individuality is a waveform that is emerging from this infinite ocean of 
conscious self. But that that infinite ocean is you. You are that being as well. Then, and there is no death. So if someone threatens me, I go, well, make my day and kill me. I'm going to, you know what I said to the head of army intelligence? I, I said, I'll be so much more trouble to you on the other side in the worlds of light than I will be on this plane. Make my day and kill me. I literally said, that. you know, that's how I am. Do you know me? I mean, I'm saying these things. I mean, it's outrageous, I guess, but it's true. Everything I'm telling you is hundred percent true. But, and he looked he's like, oh my God, you know, I said, yeah, that's the way it is. But I think that's how you develop courage too, because courage is not folly. Courage is, comes from the French word heart. And it's the feeling and the love and the consciousness of this higher consciousness and spirituality. And it's almost a divine level of love, not necessarily religious. I mean, religiosity bothers me sometimes a lot, but, but spirituality on a deep level. And that gives you the courage to do the right thing in the face of uh, tyranny. I mean, look at, look at the people who have, st who stood up like Wallenberg, who stood up to Adolf Hitler and, and, and saved all those Jewish children. Um, look at what's going on with the heroes in Ukraine right now. Uh, look at, look at the, the people who have done this throughout history and, and did uh, amazing feats of courage. There is an aspect of them that they could tap. Now, all of us have to do that, not only to become ambassadors to these extraterrestrial civilizations so that they have a point of contact. And let me explain to you, and I never talk about this in a form this big, but time is getting short. If, worse, if some of these worst case scenarios play out, and there is an intervention that's very large from this cosmic organization they're going to need people here humans to interface with i doubt it's going to be at 1600 pennsylvania avenue or at the pentagon it's going to be you and however many hundreds of thousands of people are going to see this you need to own that responsibility because what i've learned from the ets is that when they had the betrayals and the things that happened in the 40s and 50s, they have turned increasingly to the masses, the people in contact. That's why contact is happening. It's because happening everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. It, it's happening, happening everywhere. everywhere. It's, it's, it's happening everywhere. And so if you just make a little effort in that direction, you know, get the CE5 contact app, adapt it to your own needs and interests. I mean, I have no attachment to, uh, it's the concepts and the intent that's important, but that's a starting point, it works. Um, and then let put yourself at service to the universe, put yourself at service to humanity. Um, that's what I've always tried to do, uh, you know, to the extent of my frailty of a, being a human. And I think that that's what everyone should aspire to do and actually then do it. Um, you know, it's time to get out of the headspace and intellect and actually get into the deeper heart and spirit of this and act. Uh, and for that, we're going to need another phase. And that's, as we're, I'm seriously talking to some people because I really think the big money people and the governments and corporations are not going to support the change that we need. I think we may have to go the route of, I don't know, uh, an NFT or a cryptocurrency or something. Uh, of course, you know, as you know, I can barely turn a computer on. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a real idiot with stuff like that. But, um, you know, hey, you know, I was born in 55. We're not exactly the di children of digi digital age. But um, I, I, we need help with that because I actually think there's enough goodwill out there that we could do that and raise the funds and then have the resources to create these technologies bypass the system and release them open source. Open source means no patent, no intellectual property, blockchain, boom, out to the world. Um, because I think that, that it's an emergency now. Uh, and you know, when I first emerged on the scene, I, I said to the people in, in the White House and others that I'm an emergency doctor and I can identify an emergency that's, that's about to happen in an individual. 
I sense there's an emergency situation on Earth with the body of humanity and the Earth herself, the biosphere. And I said, so we have to act accordingly. We have to be skilled, all of us, skilled physicians for Gaia and humanity. You don't have to be a medical doctor to do that. I mean, but, um, but you do need to have the will to do it and recognize there's a problem and that it is urgent uh, and emergent. And of course, I think with watching the great power posturing over Ukraine, where on every news network, they're openly talking about the possibility of Armageddon with nuclear weapons. I mean, this is the, honestly, now this I haven't said publicly, but this is the most dangerous situation I have seen since I was ducking under my desk in second or third grade during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1963. And literally, it was duck and cover. You know, they thought that if you hit under your desk, you'd be protected from a thermonuclear bomb. I mean, go figure how stupid. Um, but that was what we were trained to do because we were in the strike zone from the Russian missiles that were in Cuba, the Soviet missiles in Cuba, where I lived in North Carolina, in Charlotte, and which had a missile factory. And we were a tr strike city. So we were literally being herded on the school bus and practicing evacuations and hiding under desks. This, that was a very dangerous situation. It was during Kennedy's term. This situation is approaching that level of danger. And we need everyone praying for peace, manifesting peace, but then doing practical steps working for peace. Right. And then the, the, the plan B, if things get out of control, and it's like Dr. You know, Colonel Bearden, who did all the work on these energy devices. And he said, I have this wonderful interview with him. It's on our YouTube channel. And he says, now, friends, don't get me wrong. The fools may blow it yet. He's from Louisiana. Hilarious. I love being at his home in Huntsville uh, near the uh, Redstone Arsenal and Marshall Space Flight Center. And, you know, and, and he said, I said, yes, and that's why we need. Uh, other plants, you know, we, we don't want to put all our eggs in the basket of the political leaders and these geopolitical uh, superpowers. The, the people need to come together in consciousness and meditation and in action to start providing the solutions. Right. And because I think this top down model, you know, where we expect everything to somehow percolate from on high and out of Washington or London or Moscow Never going to happen. Uh, that that I, I'm, excuse me. I think that's a fool's errand. If you you know, I would not put the future of the planet in those hands. I've dealt with these people for too many years. Uh, there are many good people in government, but the system is rigged to stop anything positive really happening that would upset the power oligarchs, the elites of the world. Right. Um, and, and that's just unfortunately the way it is. But I do think large numbers of people acting together and in unity, that is going to be that's a different story. Right. And, and that's I how we that, that's how we did the civil rights movement. I mean, I, I lived through, uh, you know, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, women's rights. I mean, I was born in 55. And and, uh, you know, I, I shared this story on Demi Lovato's podcast. I mean, I had a black girlfriend in high school and was hit and tried to be killed by a car by a bunch of racists because I had a black girlfriend. That's how dangerous having a black girlfriend was in 1972 and 1973 in North Carolina. Um, but I think that, you know, these big changes that happened, that change did not happen from Washington down. It happened in, on, on the grassroots, nonviolent civil disobedience, nonviolent action. Not in favor of anything, rioting, burning, looting, none of that. Not, we can do it. Gandhi overthrew the entire British Empire and liberated India nonviolently. So we can do this. And, I, and think, I, I do think a lot of people are getting, literally, there's a lot of contact. People are getting a lot of messages. Yes. And, and they're 
they're speaking out and saying, okay, I'm getting this constant message and what do I do with this? And, <laughs> and I'm saying, yeah. ask, ask what to do with it and keep your yes. eyes and ears open and right. the path will unfold in front of you. All you mm -hmm. need to do is step onto it <laughs> and mm -hmm. move forward. But I think it's, people are getting messages because you and I have talked about this. There are so many of these mm -hmm. beings who are watching this and who are interacting and who are taking an active look at all of this and they're they're helping they're reaching out to help people and guide people who are want to help yeah on many dimensions it's, yes. it's not just extraterrestrial it's oh, no, spiritual no. beings it's a many many levels many um and our ancestors and i'll step way out on a limb here our our, our descendants <laughs> our descendants yes our descendants from half a million years in the future are also helping us yes that'll oh, blow wow. people's mind but i know that to be a fact yeah. um so yeah. so and in here we sit right in 2022 so it's a beautiful thing and you know i, I want to mention this uh, this film again it, uh, just for clarity it, it's not uh, my film i didn't produce it um uh, the cousin brothers wanted to interview me and uh, have me sort of present the information. Uh, Michael Schratz in it. Uh, Jim Goodall, who's a very famous aerospace illustrator, is in it. Oh, yeah, I met him. There's, there's a one. Yeah, he was at the 20th anniversary of our, of our uh, disclosure project. Um, he was the last man, uh, one of the last people to talk to uh, Lockheed Skunk Works, uh, Ben Rich. Um, and so, and it's good. Its focus is really on these technologies and the existence of them and the covert programs i think it's very timely but we need to connect it and we can actually take a pause if you want to see the trailer we yeah, want to connect say we happen to have that oh we okay okay well, we happen to let's... have that trailer so uh let's okay. take a quick look at that okay if the crash retrievals are truth then all bets are off It's very hard for people to get their minds around where the real power is. And it's not at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The reality is something much more stark. They've been working on this for 60, 70, perhaps 80 years. The reason why the government is talking about these UFOs now, they're getting ready for the next level of war. Are these objects a national security concern? They're proffering a narrative of a national security threat that doesn't exist. I call them alien reproduction vehicles. They're made by private corporations somewhere on this planet. Technology from Roswell from 1947 has largely been held back from us. Portal technology, teleportation, whatever you can imagine, it's already been done. The biggest secrets are not the zero point energy and electric gravitics. It's the science of consciousness. All their communication systems are moving through the consciousness field and are thought actuated. The people of the CIA call it WSFM, weird science and frickin' magic. The transdimensional interstellar technology will benefit humanity. There has been tremendous disinformation. The media is keeping secrets with the government. These are lethal, vicious people. And I'm focused on exposing the extraordinary technologies that they would want to keep secret. No aspect of life on Earth will be unaffected by it. Now, can you talk a little bit about, you were, you were I interrupted you there, you were connecting something now that we've watched the trailer. Uh, say a few words about what you hope that people will take away from this. Look at all of that and look at it. I know because there's, there's a lot of jargon and a lot of physics and a lot of evidence. Just look at all of it as an alternative energy and propulsion system to replace everything that's destroying the world, everything that's caused these geopolitical imbalances with oil and petrostates. Look at it as a huge collection of solutions that have been sitting around for 100 years on black shelves in covert programs that need to be liberated. 
They need to be brought out and brought to bear to benefit humanity, but only to be used for peaceful purposes. The, 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 you know, I, I always warn the people, every technology is a double-edged sword. You can use it for good or for harm. You can take uh, a knife and put butter on your bread, or you can slit someone's throat. I, unfortunately, I've unfortunately have seen both. So um, no matter how primitive the technology or how advanced, what is critical is the consciousness that wields it, the wisdom that behind its use. Right. And so as you look at those technologies, you also have to understand, as Einstein said, no problem has been solved by the level of consciousness that created it. The creation of the, the consciousness of conquest, of domination, of aggression, of war, of militarism, that's got to go away. And then all these technologies, all of them, including the ones that fly, can come out and be used peacefully. If we're not in a consciousness of peace and we don't evolve to that, any of these technologies can also be used as a fierce weapon system. So that, again, gets into this sort of existential crisis and decision, the choice, I call it the choice, the big choice humanity is facing. Do we choose annihilation? Do we choose enlightenment, peace, universal peace on earth and in space, and then become a people that travel amongst the stars? That's the choice. And that's how clearly we need to articulate it to our fellow brothers and sisters on earth. Right. And that would be the choice I would make. It's the choice we're all wanting to make, yeah. but we have to actually take action and do it. So right. well, thank you, Pat. I know it's, it's getting thank late you, Dr. here. Greer. We appreciate you weighing in on all this and explaining and your unique uh, viewpoint for this. Um, we yes, really you're welcome. That. Thank you. And never, never, everyone never give up hope. Just work and keep your, keep your vision on that horizon of this transition, the transformation to this good future. That's how I get up every day and how I keep going. Don't get bogged down. There are a lot of things that are, are frightening and negative, but stay connected to your inner higher self and keep your vision on that horizon of transformation and enlightenment, not only for yourselves, but for the planet. That's what you need to focus on and not get overwhelmed with the negativity. Great. Thank you again, All Dr. Right. Greer. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.